and Monica. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would become more real to us as we open it. Lord, I just pray that you would guide us through this sermon time and that there would be, as always, so much more of you and so much less of me. Through Christ I come. Amen. Friends, did you ever notice how some of our Christmas traditions can really become distractions? How did these things that might have started out pointing us to Jesus point us now in other directions? <laughs> yeah, oh, hey, Mr. Lord David, I hope you're a good boy this year. Did you want to miss a snack? How does this happen? And more importantly, well, we just don't know where these traditions will go next, do we? <laughs> yeah, well, good, good morning, James. Good morning, John. Marvin. Now, the question really is, what should we do with these traditions? And what can we do about it right now? May I suggest to you this morning that perhaps we Good need morning, to Todd. gently push <laughs> these traditions off to the side. Merry Christmas. We need to let them go so that we can focus more on Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that all traditions are bad. In fact, many traditions have delightfully sacred Jesus-focused origins but they've become bloated with a lot of secular baloney. My unofficial sermon title for this series is Christmas or Crap, Unwrapping Traditions That Can Distract or Delight Us from the True Joy We Can Find in Jesus' Birthday. Over the next few Sundays, we're going to do some unwrapping. We want to expose some of the origins of Christmas traditions that have gone a little or maybe even a lot off the rails, and attempt to set them back on track. The world is annually celebrating the most important birthday in the, in the history of birthdays. And oftentimes, the world forgets who was born. So let's just look at the man at the center of many Christmas traditions. A figure who has become the focus of many Christmas gatherings, a centerpiece of popular Christmas culture, and almost a substitute for Jesus at times. He is known by many names around the world. Sinterklaas in my beloved Netherlands. Sir Christmas in the UK. Father Frost in Russia. Kris Kringle and, of course, Santa Claus. But most of these names point back to a man who was wildly in love with Jesus, his word, and his church, and with incredible passion and devotion served. His name was St. Nicholas. Your point to ponder is simply this on your outline. The real St. Nicholas loved Jesus. The real St. Nicholas loved Jesus. We know Nicholas was born in Patera, Greece, March 7th, 270 A.D. That's roughly 300 years after Jesus was born. He had wealthy parents who were devoted followers of Jesus. They wanted to have children, but were married 30 years before they had Nicholas. You see, Nicholas came into their lives much like Sarah and Hannah and Elizabeth's baby boys. They came as wonderful, miraculous gifts. His parents tragically died in a plague, 
and he inherited their wealth. But since he was so young, he went to live with his uncle, who was a pastor, who continued training him in the faith and drew him into ministry. Now, Nicholas took the words of Jesus to heart when he read Luke chapter 12, verses 27 to 34. So I'd like for you to read those too. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 12, verses 27 through 34. You might open up to Luke chapter 12, verses 27 through 34 and go, wait a minute, there's no angels. There's no stable. There's no, no. I'm talking about the Bible verses that impacted St. Nicholas and the words of Jesus that made him the man that he was. I'm in Luke chapter 12. I can still hear pages fluttering, so I will wait a little bit. For those of our, our guests and visitors here, uh, there are Bibles stationed on the pews for you to use. Uh, if you don't have a Bible you can read and understand, grab it, open it up, and if you like it, take it home as an early Christmas gift from us to you. These are the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 12, verse 27 is where I'll start. Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Verse 28. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Verse 30. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will make a little note there. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mm, I don't know about you, but I need to hear those words at Christmas time. It's not about chasing the stuff, folks. God wants to supply us with all we need. Verses 27 through 34, Nicholas knew his life was about giving. Nicholas knew his life was about giving. How has or will these words of Jesus impact you this Christmas? I didn't read those words just to read them to you. I hope they impact you in some way on how you respond to Christmas. Then Nicholas, seeing his wealth, especially after hearing the words, sell your possessions and give to the poor, Nicholas responded. He began giving away the fortune his parents had left him, and it changed his life, and it changed the lives of many people around him. He knew Jesus gave his life for us, and now it was Nicholas's turn to give back. The most popular story of St. Nick is related to his giving. As the story goes, a man fell into poverty who had three daughters of marrying age, but he had no dowry to give them, so they would likely be sold into slavery. Now, we don't really understand this, but back in the early centuries, when women wanted to get married, their family had to give a dowry, a pile of money, to the suitors, to the future husband. And if you didn't have that dowry, you wouldn't get married. Nicholas heard about this and snuck over to their house in the night and threw a bag of gold that landed in the oldest one's stocking through the window, which hung by the fire to dry. This happened again the second night to the second daughter. And so the next night, the father, who wanted to know who the giver was, slept by the window when Nicholas returned, he threw in the gold and woke up the father, who chased him through the night and caught him and proclaimed, Nicholas, it's you. To which Nicholas responded that he must tell no one and that it was God who'd provided the gifts. Now, I just want to know, 
How many people in the house today hang stockings somewhere during the Christmas season? Really? There's only six of you. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. A few more. Okay, now this is, this is an old tradition. This is an old tradition, but how many people uh, have gotten oranges? Do you ever get oranges at Christmas? My, uh, my, parent, my, my mom would talk about that's what they would get at Christmas. They would get oranges. Did you know that that's a, a Nicholas tradition? Because most people can't throw in bags of gold anymore. So they get oranges. But the giving of the orange is a Nicholas tradition. The hanging of stockings is a Nicholas tradition that I think is quite beautiful. In this way, Jesus, uh, Nicholas lived out the teachings of Jesus. And there's another teaching of Jesus that I really want you to go to right now. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is a beautiful text that I don't know that I've ever read at Christmas, but it's the perfect text to read at Christmas time when we are giving gifts. I'm in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Be careful. Do not let your acts of righteousness, be careful, do not, I'm sorry, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Verse 3. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Nicholas knew he got to give. Nicholas knew he got to give. Nicholas knew he got the wealth he got, not so he could hoard it, but so he could give it away to God's glory. What, what did you get your wealth for? Uh, again, you've heard me say it so many times. We're rich. From a global perspective, we're loaded. What, what were you given that wealth for? How about so you can get a bag of goods for people to people? Many of you are already getting green local gifts, and there are a few left. This sort of giving we really can and should do all year, but I think it's especially sweet at Christmas. I often facilitate giving as a go-between for those who want to give anonymously. And I, honestly, folks, that is one of the most fun things I do as a pastor. Facilitate those anonymous gifts that are given among the church folk. Everyone should do some secret giving like Nicodemus did. Jesus told us to. And this is just another quick plug, although so many of you uh, give so generously to the Compassion Fund, that is another direct way of giving anonymously to folks in need. The elders disperse it, and we do it anonymously. So people know that it comes from SMC, but they don't know who it comes from, really, in the church. And we give it to people, uh, and a lot of people don't find out who we give to either. We try and do it as, as uh, quietly as we can, uh, in that spirit of not letting know the left hand uh, what the right hand is doing. I just want to share one more story that parallels Nicodemus and Jesus' life, then I'm going to let you go. The story is told that Nicodemus took a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And on his voyage, the boat got caught up in a terrible storm. Nicodemus stood up and prayed that God would save them and calm the storm. At once, the storm subsided, and the boat reached its destination safely. This parallels Mark chapter 4. If you'd want to go right over to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. This is the story of when Jesus calms the storm. And friends, I know uh, some of you right now are in the midst of storm. 
For some of you, the whole holiday season is just one big storm. And you need someone to calm it. You need someone to quiet it. Friends, not only will Jesus do that for us, but he says, you know, you can pray too. You can call on me, and I'll calm the storm as well. I'm in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. Verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a Teacher, Don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down and was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Finally, Nicholas knew prayer was powerful. What do you need God to save you from this Christmas? Eventually, Nicholas became a bishop. That is, someone who, who oversees and helps other churches. And his reputation for helping children and sailors and other people in need spread far and wide. For this, the Roman emperor, the horrible, Christian-hating Diocletian, persecuted, imprisoned, and tortured him, as well as other religious men of that time. Some estimates say that he was in prison being tortured for up to five years. Only until the Romans realized that they had so filled their prisons with pastors that they had no place to put thieves and murderers. So he was released under the orders of Emperor Constantine the Great. Upon his release, Nicholas continued his charity work until he died on December 6th, 343 AD. Friends, you need to know that Nicholas was just a man who was radically saved by Jesus a mere 300 years after Jesus walked the earth. You know, I find it fascinating that it's possible that Nicodemus's, or I'm sorry, Nicholas's parents, and maybe Nicholas himself, could have interacted with second or third generation Christians. People who could have said, yeah, Peter, he was my great grandpa. Paul, he was my great great uncle on my mother's side. Can you imagine that? This was the world that St. Nick lived in. He was a man who knew early tragedy, his parents' death. Think about what a shock that would have been to him as a child. And yet they had instilled a faith in Jesus who would not die. And then severe persecution for following Jesus and doing good. Yet he kept his faith and saw miracles happen and the church continued to grow. Friends, I hope that every time you see a Santa Claus over the next few weeks, that you'll be able to unwrap his cultural baggage and see the historical saint that he stands for. And behind the historical saint, see the Jesus that he loved. St. Nicholas is a witness for Jesus that challenges us to see everything we have as a gift to be given. But also, that we not give for our glory, but rather for God's, and give secretly as the ultimate expression of faithfulness and thankfulness to God. Finally, I hope that we will embrace the power of prayer that celebrates the miracles we can witness and give glory to God for. Remember, friends, the real Saint Nick, he loved Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the impact that your words can have on a guy like Nicholas. Lord, those same words are the ones we just heard. Lord, what do you want us to do to be a witness for you this Christmas? Is it giving in secret? Is it praying for miracles? 
Is it being witness to storms that are calmed? Lord, whatever you want to do with us this Christmas, help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray.